because there seems to be this dichotomy between justice and moral order, right? Where if you care about justice, then you'll go to the left uh, uh, culturally or politically. If you care about morals, morality, moral order, you'll go to the right. But we don't think that that's how the gospel works. We think that the gospel is both love and truth, compassion and conviction, justice and moral order. There are two things we're not supposed to talk about in the world, uh, politics and religion. But today, because of who we are, we're gonna talk about both. So it feels like politics is more divisive than ever before, but it really doesn't have to be that way. Today we're talking with Justin Gibney, who is a Christian, an attorney, the founder of, or co-founder of the Anne Campaign, and he just released a book last month that's entitled Compassion, Conviction, The Anne Campaign's Guide to Faithful Civic Engagement. Thank you for your time today. Um, I just want to start with a really basic question for this conversation. Uh, should Christians even be concerned about politics in general? Uh, the answer is yes. I, I'll fill that out. But I, I'll, I first want to say, Jude, thank you for having me, man. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, have this conversation. But yeah, I think Christians should be um, concerned about politics because I think that the gospel has uh, uh, political uh, applications uh, and, and political implications. Uh, now, I always start that conversation by saying, first and foremost, it's I completely agree that Christians should first and foremost be concerned about proclaiming the gospel. I think that's our number one purpose, and that's clear uh, in the Bible. However, that takes nothing away from the fact that throughout Isaiah, throughout Amos, throughout James and so on, it is very clear that uh, the, that. Uh, God has an expectation that we will do justice and we'll be involved in that. And I think politics is a tool for us to do for us to do that. I think politics presents us with a robust opportunity to love our neighbors. And if we truly love our neighbors uh, like we love ourselves, then we would do for the, them the things that we would do for ourselves. And I often use the example, you know, if, if, if your child, you know, cut their knee and they're bleeding on the ground. Sure, you pray. Sure, you believe in proclaiming the gospel. But you would also do something about that because God has put things in your, uh, you know, around you that allow you to help them. And so you would help them and, and make sure that you disinfected it, put a bandaid on it. If it needed stitches, you put stitches on it. Well, I would say that, that we would have to do the same thing for our neighbor when we're able. And so when since politics is a is a uh, robust opportunity to do that, we should take that opportunity. Otherwise, I think we might be poor stewards of what God has given us. You co-wrote uh, Conviction and Compassion with some of your other workers at, at the Ant Campaign. Uh, it has eight chapters. Uh, it deals with everything from church and state to partnerships and partisanships, uh, politics and race. Uh, was there like a, a foundational principle that ran through the whole book that you guys started with that helped you write each chapter? Absolutely. The, the core chapter is going to be chapter three, and that's Compassion and Conviction. Uh, we, you know, when we started the Ant Campaign and in writing this book, we were trying to um, dismantle what we saw as a false dichotomy. Because when we get into politics, even when we get into cultural conversations, there seems to be this dichotomy between justice and moral order, right? Where if you care about justice, then you'll go to the left uh, uh, culturally or politically. If you care about morals, morality, moral order, you'll go to the right. Um, and we said, OK, we get that and that that our landscape is set up that way. But we don't think that that's how the gospel works. We think that the gospel is both love and truth, compassion and conviction, justice and moral order. And so what we wanted to do was combine those under a biblical framework, because that's what the Bible does. I mean, if you see Jesus, he shows people that normally don't receive compassion. He shows them a lot of compassion, but he doesn't remove the standards from them. Right. He doesn't say, well, I have compassion for you. Live however you want and you're fine. That's not what he does. He maintained those standards, but he also made sure that they knew that he cared and was showing, you know, was showing them love. And so we said, that's not only a spiritual thing. That's not only something we're supposed to do in church or in our interpersonal relationships. That should be our civic witness as well. We should be about compassion and conviction, justice and moral order, and realize that that separation is unfortunate. So the theme that you'll see running throughout the book is just that compassion and conviction. When we go into situations as Christians, what does our Christ-like compassion ask of us? And what does, you know, what does doctrine and the truth ask of us? And those things I think we'll find are not mutually exclusive, but actually interdependent. 
because when you have love without truth, it's a love that just doesn't have definition and anybody can make it whatever they want to make it. But when you add truth to that conversation, uh, it becomes a lot different. Yeah, you wrote a tweet last week um, that talked about being on fire for basically compassion and conviction for moral order and justice. And uh, you had a line in there that I really it stuck out to me. It said, we should be lukewarm partisans at best. Um, when that really goes, you guys talked a lot about that in the book as well. What should the extent of our partnership or our alliance uh, be with political parties as Christians? Just as that tweet said, I think our, our um, connection to them should be um, about using parties as a tool. So we're using politics as a tool, but we're also using parties as a tool, which be, would be a very big change from how a lot of people see uh, parties today. Because what a lot of us do today is we have it as part of our identity. And so we're not lukewarm when it comes to our party because our party is us. I can't tell you how many people when I say, yeah, I've, I've been in Democrat po politics for a while. I'm a Democrat. They think they know so much about me. And you actually don't know that much about me at all from that statement. And that's how it should be, because my identity is not tied up in that. And so, Jude, if you came up to me, you said the Democrats have this issue, that issue. And the third, I disagree. with. I agree with you if you're right. Right. I, I don't feel like you've come at me. I can I can critique my party as well. And so I think that's the difference. We should see the party as a tool and be very lukewarm about it. I also said, you know, we should be skeptical of party loyalty, because what does that really mean? Does it mean we're loyal to the party when they have bad policy? Does it mean we're loyal to the party when its leaders uh, show bad behavior? I think that's unfaithful. So we really have to question what party loyalty means. And I'll tell you, if, if, a, if a Republican is in a better position to take office than a Democrat, then that's who I would vote for. It, uh, my, my party is just a tool that says very little about my identity. Yeah, I think that's that's an important key. Uh, it's not your identity. So you said, you know, if I come at the Democratic Party, I'm not attacking you. In my personal life, there are a lot of relationships I have that you can't talk about politics because they are so attached to a candidate or a party or a single issue. It's hard to see the status of our own hearts and minds sometimes. What are some yeah. good indicators that we are too aligned? One thing I ask everyone to do is you have to be able to identify at least six serious issues that your party or your ideological tribe mm -hmm. get wrong. If you can't do that, I think it's problematic. And, and you should get our book because we identify those on both sides. And as you know, you know, we're we're very even handed. We're just being biblical. We're just applying the gospel to both sides. And so we're mm -hmm. not leaning or trying to make one side look better than the other. But I, yeah, but I would tell people, look, you need to identify at least six major things wrong with your party or your ideological tribe. If you can't do that, it's problematic. If every time someone has a critique of your party or tribe, you get upset, that's also a signal that there's a problem there because Christians always need to have a level of separation from the party. Uh, we always need to have a level of separation from the people in our ideology. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to critique them. And we ended up just going along with whatever they put out. And we also need to do that so we can frame the issues for ourselves. And that's one of the biggest problems. We, we allow our parties to frame the issues for us. And you know, Jude, if a, a question is framed the wrong way, there could actually be two wrong answers. And I, I think in our society, we, we get two wrong answers a lot instead of getting one right, one wrong answer. I'm assuming you would say we shouldn't be single issue voters. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with understanding that certain issues may be more consequential than others. But I think so much of politics works together. And so when you just focus and put one issue in a vacuum, you're missing some of the other issues that may uh, kind of be a part of that issue or lead to that issue. So I would I would warn against it, but I, I'm I best I'm basically just saying be thoughtful about uh, politics as a whole, and I think you'll be slower to put anything in a vacuum, which doesn't mean that you're any less passionate about that one issue or that you would uh, be quiet about it. I'm not saying that at all, but, but you should you know pay attention to others as well because you could be missing a kind of a something that could help you on that issue. Yeah. So then if, say, for instance, how do we prioritize? If we if we call ourselves pro-life, you know, from womb to tomb is, is a popular saying, you know, and it seems like Republicans are much more anti-abortion pro-life. And then Democrats, though, are the ones who generally have policies that help poor people, immigrants, orphans, widows, uh, you know, as, as it says in the Old Testament. So is there a, a set of principles or a framework that we can use to kind of uh, prioritize what works? Is it, is it a matter of, you know, practicality or is it a matter of the, the 
priorities of the Bible? How do you, how do you recommend we do that? Yeah, I mean, practicality surely plays into it. Uh, so we're not, we're not going to just uh, do this in theory and act like we can get it perfect and that there's not, not going to be any kind of conflict or, you know, that we don't have to, there's no trade-ins. I mean, there are trade-ins and conversations that you have to say. But one thing I say is you kind of have to look around your community, right? Um, you know, if you look around your community and see some of the issues that are going on, you have to say, okay, well, how much, how big are those issues compared to these other ones? Abortion is huge. And I think as a, a pro-life Democrat, that a lot of Democrats need to be more focused on it. Uh, but I think there are also other issues that make women feel like that's a good decision, right? And whether it's um, uh, their financial situations, whether this, it's the support we have, whether they there's not enough uh, pregnancy centers to help them, whether it's in our education system that they're being taught that that's, the, that's the, a good option to make. There are a lot of other conversations we need to have. And so we just have to look at it as a, as a whole. I don't think that there's a bright line rule. I think you have to uh, inform yourself within your community, talk with others, and, and really just try to weigh those issues together. The, the problem comes not that when somebody says that's an important issue for them, but when they don't consider any of the other issues and they just mm -hmm. um, kind of dismiss everything else and just focus on that one thing. Don't look at how you know the, the politician they're supporting talks to other people, how he treats people or any of that stuff. Just care about that one issue and dismiss everything else. I think that's problematic. Uh, in this book, we give a framework so we don't tell everybody exactly where to land on every single issue, but we do think that, mm -hmm. that the Bible pre pre prevents, uh, pre presents us with the framework to work within, which creates boundaries, right? Uh, you and I could disagree on the marginal tax rate. You may take that more seriously than I do, but there are some issues when it comes to pro-life things, when it comes to uh, the poor, that we should be very close on. Uh, and that's what we try to focus on in the book. Yeah, I really did appreciate that, that you guys didn't push an agenda, really, outside of biblical application um how uh do you all agree with each other there's three authors so how how much do you guys agree do you align do you misalign uh was it easy to write this in that way yeah i, I mean I, i'll be the first to tell you i think the holy spirit had a lot to do with us getting this uh, book <laughs> done and, and done and, and still being uh, very good friends yeah we we have disagreements i mean we don't we don't agree on everything um but again when there's a disagreement if it's within that framework, that's okay. If it's outside of the framework, then the Bible is the, is the decision maker there, right? And we had to just mm -hmm. go to scripture and see, okay, where do we land on, on this? Most of the time we, we agreed on stuff because again, we weren't taking certain specific positions and telling people where to land. We were creating a framework that we're all familiar with, uh, that, you know, that we've all uh, applied before and spoken about. And so most of the time we were on the same page and when we weren't, uh, we just had to talk it out and, and maybe, you know, and, and, and just make sure that we were it within the framework, within those disagreements. Um, but writing it was great. We just kind of gave, you know, each of us took different chapters. We'd write it, we come together, talk about those chapters, revise, and it just worked out. I, I, don't, I don't know that that was under our own power, but it, it, it did work. 2016 to me felt like a, a revelation, you know, it was an apocalypse of, of who we are as a country. Um, and I, I know a lot of people who grew up going in white evangelical church uh, struggled, struggled with what we were doing, with what we were saying. Uh, I've had several friends who've walked away from church since then. But I just want your personal experience, like is, is the divisiveness that you are seeing within, within Christian culture, within churches, is it more than it's ever been politically or is it just being revealed and it was always under the surface, do you think? That's a complex. Yeah, I think that's a little com more complicated than we make it sometimes, because if you look throughout history, I mean, when you're talking about Jim Crow, when you're talking about slavery, if those times weren't more divided, they probably should have been. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so so it's hard to say today is more divided, but certainly it's it's extremely polarized. And it's at the you know, it's at the forefront. People people see it and they know what I've had pastors tell me that they literally pastors at multicultural churches had people fighting in the church about the 2016 election. Uh, and so what we wanted to do in writing this book was make sure that Christians came out of 2020 better than they came out of 2016, that we were mm. equipping the church with how to deal with it, which is to say that these political issues are very important. We didn't want to, to act like politics weren't important, so don't worry about it, just get along. We wanted people to know they are important and we should be engaged, but that they're not the ultimate thing, that it's never worth losing a brother over one of these elections. Because at the end of the day, we know that God is in control and we, we have 
uh, other tools that we can use outside of that particular election. Election is one part of a much broader political system, especially on the local level. And when we're mm -hmm. talking about local issues, most of that isn't even partisan. So I mm -hmm. think it helps a lot of Christians to say, wait, maybe I can step back a little bit. I can engage, but step back a little bit from the, the national stuff and realize that the state and local stuff, I can get together with the other Christians and really not have to be worried about the party side of it. Uh, and that's what th those are the type of things that we wanted to point out to people to say, hey, there's ways to get through this. And as we come together and understand how to be more biblical, we got to love our brothers and sisters through this because, you know, we're a church and we have to stay together. Yeah. What do you think about groups of Christians? You know, should churches or Christian media companies, for instance, which is where I work, uh, should we be involved in politics as a group? Yeah, I think one, I think there are ways to get engaged, uh, whether it's a church or a faith organization. We recommended, you know, having a platform just about the issues, not to support one candidate or another. You know, we did a big uh, event in Chicago called uh, a Faith and Politics Forum, where we invited all the Chicago mayor, uh, mayoral candidates, and they came. We had praise and worship, uh, and then we had like a, a, a forum, you know, a political forum. Uh, and so we set the tone, letting people know this is a Christian, a Christian thing. But then you just got information. We asked, we asked questions about crime, about education and all those things. And the, the crowd got to ask a question. So I think that's one place that churches can come together. Faith orders can come together to put on, you know, town halls, things of that nature, not taking a partisan side. And I think it's better when we don't in those situations, mm -hmm. but just to get information out there and equip the body to, uh, to engage, right, to, to raise civic literacy. Those things are very important, and there's no reason uh, why faith orgs in the church couldn't be involved in that. In, in that type of forum, um, something that comes, we just we talked about this before we started, but COVID, for instance, who, who depends on who you believe, right? So how do you know, how do you measure, how do you uh, vet any expert's opinion? How I mean, we're not experts. You know, you're a lawyer. You get to, uh, you understand the law better than, than I do. Um, and you can vet someone's opinion. There's other people who are political anal analysts who can do that. So for the layman, what are ways that we can evaluate truth? What are resources we can go to to say, this law will have this effect on these people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the first thing I would say about that is that you pointed out that it's really hard to do as an individual. I mean, you got mm -hmm. kids, you have uh, jobs to do, you have other social things in your life that you wanna get done. Not everybody's going to be like me and just be looking at politics and uh, all those economic things all the time. Right. But that just shows us is why we need to do it in community. We need to do it through institutions. So we need to you know, we, there's a distrust in institutions, but institutions are vital for us being a, you know, effective in the political uh, sphere. Because institutions allow us to say, hey, I'm not the expert on this stuff, but I trust these guys. I trust that they're honest. I trust that they're biblical. And I would like to engage them for the, you know, hour or two that I can a week or how many you know, hours I can give a month to keep me kind of up to date on what's going on. Because I don't have time to filter all that stuff out through a biblical lens. It's not my expertise. And I, you know, and I have other things that I have to do. I really think we have to do that through institutions. There are, you know, there are Christians who speak about these things all the time, but we need to take the time to build some of that stuff. So I wish I could just point you to a whole bunch of different places, uh, but we need to take time to build, you know, some of, build up our institutions so that we can raise civic literacy and, and, have a better understanding of, of what, um, you know, what economic uh, uh, system does what. How would you, how would you define justice? I, I probably should ask that earlier, but I think that's an important thing to, to talk about. What does biblical justice look like? Great question. I love that question. And I think as Christians, we have to start with, uh, I start with the Imago Dei. I start that everybody has value. Uh, that everyone has human dignity. And to me, justice is treating people on the level that they deserve based on their human dignity, right? So there are some things that you should not do to people because we believe that ha they have human dignity. So whether it's, you know, uh, mistreating them on the job or whether it's imprisoning them unjustly, and we see a lot of that in the Bible, those are things that we should not do because we value people regardless of who they are regardless of what their religion is. And so that's what, I mean, if you look through the Bible, uh, you can go to Amos, right? And Amos, he, God sends Amos to tell them, he, he threatens Israel that you guys, you're done. And it wasn't because of uh, sexual immorality. It wasn't because of a lot of things that we talk about. It was because mm -hmm. there was partiality in the courts. 
You know, it was because how they were treating the poor, right? They were being unjust and God cared about that. And God said, I'm almost through with you because of how, because you have made, you have gotten comfortable with this iniquity, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just injustice. How should we be treating people? What's the standard for how we should be treating people? Are we seeing them as image bearers? Are we providing them with uh, what, what they deserve based, based off that, based off things that we can't take away from them. Um, and so that's really how we define biblical justice. It's through the Imago Day, it's through dignity and the standard that God sets for how people should be treated. And that's all through, you know, the, the Old Testament, again, Isaiah, uh, Micah, uh, Amos, you go to James, you see it in the Gospels and how Jesus interacts and Jesus shows social concern. So people are right that Jesus just doesn't go around saying, I'm taking down the government. I'm doing no, but he shows social concern. He shows that he cares about people. And the great commandment, the second half of the great commandment shows how we should feel about our neighbors. And how does that translate into action? Uh, so we know that our works don't save us, but our works are indicative of what what's written on our hearts. And that's what we should kind of be focused on. Uh, what is the big idea that you hope people walk away from after reading the book? Like what's the main, you, the, man, okay, they got it, they understood it, success. What, what is that thing for you guys? Uh, that Christians need to be Christian first when we walk into the civic space. Uh, mm -hmm. That we seriously limit our public witness when we outsource it to Democrats, Republicans, progressives, or uh, conservatives, right? Our public witness and our sociopolitical uh, perspective is so much more thorough and so much more brilliant than anything that we would find that's made by human hands. And parties and ideologies are made by human hands. So what we're asking Christians to do is not limit yourself to what you see coming from them. Don't let them frame the issue. Frame the issues for yourself based on the Bible. Um, and that's just so much a better way to go into politics. So we're not telling people don't be in parties. We're not telling people that you can't associate or, or uh, kind of go back and forth when, when it comes to uh, different ideologies. But you have to be Christian first. And that forces you to frame the issues differently. And it forces you to critique your side of the aisle, critique your, uh, your ideological tribe. I, I just have to ask this. How should a Christian vote in 2020? <laughs> <laughs> they should vote uh, with the Bible in hand and with that that compassion and conviction framework. I really think you have to look you know you have to look at everything. As you know, when you ask the question, I'm not going to tell people uh, who to vo vote for, but talk to others, man. Talk to people from other communities. Have a conversation about what they're seeing and be honest with yourself. It's one thing to say I had to vote for somebody who was imperfect and they do all these other things wrong. It's another thing to say. I voted for this person and now I got to defend them. I got to act mm -hmm. like they do everything right. So whoever you vote for, just make sure that if they win, that you feel even more of an obligation to hold them accountable and to call them to, uh, you know, to call them out when necessary, because now you're responsible for putting them in there. And I think that's one of the main paradigm shifts that we talk about for Christians. Once you vote for somebody, you don't leave them to their own um, uh, devices. You don't just defend everything they do. You hold them accountable. Uh, because in a way, you're responsible from th for them being in that position. And that's what I would say. I would say, look at all the issues. Talk about it like you did. You talked about Jude in a community, whether you guys disagree or not. And then make the best decision that you can make uh, based on, you know, the issues and the understanding that you have in front of you. Where, where can people find you, support you, uh, support the AND campaign, learn more about what you guys are doing? Yeah, so you, uh, you can go to our website, which is andcampaign.org, A N D. Uh, campaign.org or you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram uh, at at A-N-D campaign. Uh, you can follow me at uh, at Justin E. Gibbony G-I-B-O-N-E-Y on Instagram and, and, uh, and Twitter. And I think, you know, if you like what you hear, share our messaging, read the book, share the book with other people. We think it will be of value and no one regardless, if you're a biblical Christian, because that's who we wrote it for. I mean, it, it is probably harder for non-biblical Christians to get into what we're saying. But if you're a biblical Christian, I think you'll find it to be fair and not representing any side of uh, the political spectrum, but trying our best to represent uh, Christ in the public square.
Thanks for watching this episode of Can I Ask You Something? We're working on more videos of personal stories and expert opinions that help you apply your faith in all of life's circumstances. Way Nation is a crowdfunded nonprofit that creates fun and meaningful blogs and videos and podcasts that give you a confident and joyful faith. You can see all of our work and lend your support at waynation.com.